It's the preview show. It's the No Name Never podcast. Hello and welcome to the preview show brought to you by the Known and Ever podcast. I'm your host, Natalie Bromley, but joining me as ever is the headliner of the preview show, the main man himself, Dave Statman Roberts. David, good evening. How are you? I'm very well, Natalie. Yourself? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. Very good. good. Very good indeed. Uh, it feels like we're riding high on the crest of a wave at the moment, doesn't it? Another win, like yes. yes. Another fantastic. win. It feels everything's good and what an absolutely roller coaster of emotions that Wolves game was. Uh, Aston just, Villa. At uh, Villa, sorry. Do you know what? I was thinking, <laughs> I don't know why I was thinking of Wolves. I think it's because I was talking to somebody about Wolves today and I, I just got my head caught in Wolves, so apologies. Yes, Aston Villa. What an absolute roller coaster. It was, yeah. It was, uh, well, yeah, disappointing first half. Uh, we did manage just about to keep ourselves in the game. I think if we'd have been two goals down at half time, it might have been a different matter. Yeah. Uh, but we weren't. We were only a goal down. And we came out. I think the Jack Cork's introduction at, um, at half time made a big difference. He uh, uh, certainly made his uh, presence known in the second half. And also uh, Matthew Vidro when he came on as well. So. Um, and we got the goals, you know, that was the main thing, getting the uh, the goals. And, yeah, the, um, Dwight's was perhaps a little bit fortunate, but the other two were uh, really good. And, uh, yeah, really good second half performance and uh, another three points. Definitely. And we are now starting to look much more up the table, aren't we, rather than down it, which is uh, which is really good. Um, well, before we move on to our next Premier League adventure, we, of course, have um, a quiz question that we need to um, ask our uh, ask our listeners uh, and give some answers to essentially. Now, before we get on to that, um, just a very quick plea from me: um, Can you, if you're going to send your answers through via Twitter, which would be fantastic, really happy for you to do them, will you send them via DM rather than on the thread? Just because um, everybody else can see answers, that's all we quite like, um, and also it gives me an alert when I've got. <laughs> and I've got them a direct message and I can uh, I can have a look at them. So that's a, just a little plea from me. Um, so at the end of the Aston Villa preview show, Dave asked you, Burnley played Aston Villa at Turf Moor in an FA Cup fifth round tie in March 1974. But other than what happened during the 90 minutes, what was especially notable about this particular match. Now, this flummoxed me, Dave. What was the answer? Uh, well, yeah, we forgot to discuss it after the programme. We had a little bit of a, 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 a DM uh, exchange afterwards and you we had did. about six guesses and you were nowhere near. I did not have six. I had two <laughs> guesses and then I gave up. <laughs> what was the answer? Uh, the answer was it was the first time that the brand new Bob Lord stand was in use for a first team game. Um, ah. The stand actually had to wait until later in the year, in September, September, in fact, for the visit of Leeds United uh, for it to be opened officially. Edward Heath, who was uh, actually no longer Prime Minister by the time he came to open it, he'd uh, lost an election in the meantime, uh, but he came to uh, to open the stand. And also, uh, Martin Dobson had been uh, sold to Everton by that time as well to uh, to pay for it. Uh, strangely wow. enough, the uh, amount the stand cost to build uh, was very similar to the uh, transfer fee Burnley got from Everton for Martin Dobson going there, which is why some people still refer to it as the Martin Dobson stand rather than the Bob Lord stand. Um, it was also uh, the first time in five years that fans have been present in all four sides of the ground because obviously prior to that the cricket field stand had been developed and as soon as that uh, was about to open they knocked down the um, the old Bruncher Road stand so that's uh, that's what happened with the ground and that was the correct answer to our quiz question. Excellent now did we have any uh, correct answers? We did. We had two very alert listeners who got in touch uh, with the correct answer. We had uh, Adrian Caton and also David Entwistle, and they both got the answer spot on. Excellent. Well, do stay tuned because, as ever, we are going to have another quiz question for you at the end of the show uh, when Dave will be setting you your homework for this week. So please do stay tuned. Opposition Stats. But let's move on to the main reason why we're here, Dave. And of course, we are previewing another Premier League fixture for the mighty Clarets who are just riding high at the moment and playing some fantastic stuff. Um, we are, of course, playing Chelsea, which is away from home, Sunday the 31st of January at 12pm kickoff, which is live on BT Sport 1. So why don't you kick us off, please, and tell us all about the opposition? 
Uh, yeah, recent history. Uh, Burnley have faced Chelsea at Stamford Bridge on six occasions since 2009 so far, uh, with all of those being Premier League games. And our record in those six games is uh, one win, two draws and three defeats. So not too bad. Um, in August 2009, after we'd been... Uh, Recently promoted up to the Premier League, uh, we suffered the second of many away defeats in our first season back in the top flight for over 33 years, Uh, and that was by a 3-0 scoreline. We did slightly better in the 2014-15 season with a 1-1 draw thanks to a headed equaliser from Ben Mee. That was in February 2015. Uh, But the following season resulted in another 3-0 defeat. Uh, That was in August 2016. However, we did register a Premier League victory at Stamford Bridge, and that was in August 2017, as the Claret shocked the reigning champions on the opening day in an eventful match, which we'll receive a little bit more detailed uh, information from us uh, later in the show. Um, Following another draw in April uh, 2019, that was by a 2-2 scoreline, we were back to suffering our standard 3-0 defeat in the corresponding fixture last season, which was played just over a year ago in January 2020, and is also featured in more detail in our next section. Excellent. Highlights and lowlights. Well, why don't we move on to our next section then and start looking at the highlights and lowlights. And will you kick us off, please, with once again, starting with our lowlight. Uh, yeah, we're going to get the low light out of the way first, once again, for this episode. And um, We've already mentioned there have been three defeats for Burnley at Stamford Bridge since 2009, all of which Chelsea won by a 3-0 scoreline. Uh, perhaps the most disappointing of the three was last season's visit to Stamford Bridge. Uh, Jeff Hendrick had the ball in the net with a far post header, but it was ruled out for a debatable marginal offside call against Ben Mee. Then Chelsea rewarded a penalty for Matt Lothan's challenge on Willian in the box, and Jorginho put away the resulting spot kick. Burnley then had a good spell of pressure before half-time, including a Ben Mee header, which was cleared off the line. But it was Chelsea who scored next with a goal from Tammy Abraham to double their lead before the break. After that, the second half was mostly one-way traffic for the home side, although they added just one more goal through Callum hudson Adoy, and the match finished as a 3-0 victory for the hosts. There you go. That's definitely a low light. What a roller coaster it is playing Chelsea. Uh, well, let, let's flip it around then and let's have a look at some highlights. And I've got a sneaky suspicion that I know what you're going to pick for this one, Dave. Well, yeah, it could have been one or two, but I've gone for uh, our last top flight win at Stamford Bridge as our highlight. And that was the uh, Premier League match which took place on the opening day of the 2017 18 season against the reigning champions. Burnley raced to a 3 0 half time lead following the early dismissal of Chelsea captain and ex clarets defender Gary Cahill for a challenge on Stephen DeFore. Uh, Sam Vokes opened the scoring after hooking in Matt Lowton's cross, and Stephen Ward doubled the lead with a fiercely struck angle shot. Burnley were in dreamland before the break when Sam Vokes headed in Stephen DeFore's cross to make it three. It wasn't all plain sailing, though. Uh, Chelsea came back into the game in the second half, uh, pulling a goal back through Alvaro Morata. And despite being reduced to nine men when Cesc Fabregas was dismissed for his second yellow card of the game, uh, David Luiz scored a late goal to make it a nervous end to the game. However, we did cling on for a famous victory. We did. Gosh, that was so... What do you think was more nerve-wracking, the last 10 minutes of that Chelsea game or the last 10 minutes of the Villa game this week? That's a close call, isn't it? Well, I wasn't. I actually wasn't watch. Well, it, 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 that was um, uh, not a televised game. That was, a, and I wasn't down there. Um, so I was kind of trying to follow that on my phone, and my phone battery was running very, very low. Um, oh, so that God. one, was, that one was actually worse because my phone battery did run out. Then I had to borrow someone else's phone to try and get oh, no. to the scores. It's a nightmare. So yeah, that one was worse. Definitely. Yeah, I think for the circumstances surrounding you trying to get the result, that was definitely worse. So, yeah, definitely. Fixture flashback. Well, let's move on then to the first of our new fixtures. Fixtures. Oh, my God. Features. New features. Fixture, fixture, features. All the Fs. Our new feature for the second half of the preview show, which is, of course, the fixture flashback. Take That's it away. That's easy for you to say. It's not that easy for me to say, I'm not going to lie. That was that was a messy business, that link, a messy business. Please t- put me out of my misery, Dave, and, and take us to the fixture fast. Oh, my God, fixture flashback, please. Uh, yeah, the latest innovation for the second half of this season is our brand-new fixture flashback section. 
Each week, we're asking you to send us your matchday memories from a particular game from the past against our next opponents, so that we can feature them on the relevant preview show. Ideally, we'd like you to record your thoughts and send them through to us, but if you don't feel comfortable making a recording, then we will also take written submissions and read them out. Uh, And this week, it's the turn of one of our listeners who got in touch to tell us about a Burnley match against Chelsea at Stamford Bridge in the 1970s. It was indeed, and this was a written submission rather than um, uh, a, a, a spoken one. So we are going to read this one out. Um, forgive me, Dave. I can't seem to see who it was who sent us this. Have we got details? Well, there's of no name on there. No, no, no not on the one right, sent right, through okay. to me. That's fine. Okay. The the, the message is essentially read. Um, Hi, I'm a newish listener and I thoroughly love the show and the presenters. Thanks very much. Uh, My memory of Chelsea Way goes back to 1974 when I was a student at Warwick University. We were due to play at Stamford Bridge in a midweek game. There was at the time a miners' strike. Just bear with me a second. My screen has just gone quiet. Uh, Miners' strike and kickoff times were brought forward to avoid using... I can't read this that well. I'm really sorry. Uh, avoid using floodlights. This suited me fine as I had no lectures on a Wednesday. When I boarded the train at Coventry, it was a beautiful winter's day. Oh, gosh, it's not going through, is this, Dave? I can't. Do you want me to carry on? Yeah, you might have to pick it up because it's, it's, I'm getting technical errors. Technical oh, errors. Right. It said, when when I boarded the train at Coventry, it was a beautiful winter's day, blue sky and sunshine. As the train got closer to London, I saw quite a lot of snow in the fields, but thought nothing of it. On arriving at Euston, I saw a newspaper stand with the words, Bridge Game Off. I asked the man if bridge meant Stamford Bridge. Yes, he replied, game off due to heavy snow on the pitch. I was gutted, to say the least. Turned round and got on the next train out of London. I've been to many grounds since, but then never to Stamford Bridge. Oh, what a shame! Well, hopefully we'll get this pandemic over with, and we can get you there. That would be uh, that would be fantastic. So, memories of Chelsea away. The first memory that pops into my mind is actually the two thousand and eight to two thousand and nine League Cup run, uh, capital punishment as it was. Uh, well, so we we were we went to Chelsea away, and I was uh, must have been seven seven or eight years old. So I was in primary school at the time. And I remember, because obviously it was a midweek game, my dad gave me a letter to hand into the, into the head teacher saying, I'm afraid George's going to have to stay off school. Uh, we're going to London. I'm going to study architecture. So then they called my dad in later in the week. And he was like, you know, what what do you want with me? And he said, oh, are you going studying architecture? Are you next week with, uh, with George in London? He was like, yeah, yeah, that's right. We're going to look at some buildings and stuff. And then the head teacher said back to him, so why has George been telling everyone all week at school that he's going to Chelsea away? <laughs> so we were rumbled. But luckily enough, we had a nice enough head teacher and they allowed us to go. So then we turned up half six in the morning or whatever stupid time it was for the uh, Aki Clarets coach from Turf. And then the Sky cameras were there. So I was all over Sky TV as well that night showing the Burnley fans leaving on the coach. So, you know, the teacher saw me then yet again. So I was totally and utterly rumbled at this point. But what a day. I remember just the coach journey down, going through London on the coach when we got there and just seeing all the Chelsea fans. And obviously at the time, going to a big Premier League ground was like still a, a complete rarity for us. And I think it was probably one of the only times I'd been to a Premier League ground. So it was absolutely incredible. And then <laughs> I actually remember Didier Drogba throwing coins at us. You know, in that one old draw, and what a result it was. I mean, to go there and win on penalties, it's a night I'll, I'll never forget. Absolutely brilliant. One of the best experiences I've had as a fan. And, and, and Chelsea away has always been a good one for me. I'll just say one more memory. When we went 3 0 up at Chelsea the other year when they were the champions, I mean, that was just absurd. That, that It was actually, I think I must have been 16. That was the first away day I've been to on my own. So I got the train down and then travelled across London on the tube. So obviously at the time it was quite a big thing. And, then, and I just remember standing there at half time, 3 nil up, just absolutely gobsmacked, just on the phone to my dad just being like, I don't know what I've just witnessed. We're 3 nil up away at the Champions and, you know, what a result that was. And it kicked us on for the European season where we finished seventh. So only the best memories at Chelsea, to be honest. And... I think with the momentum that we've got at the moment, we might be able to create some more memories this weekend. Looking forward to it. Up the Clarets. 
Now, in our next show, uh, what, what's happening for the next fixtures, Dave? Because obviously we're at home to Manchester City and then to Brighton. So what do we need from our listeners for that? Yeah, we want, really, if anyone's got a particular memory of a, a, a specific game, uh, either against Manchester City or Brighton, we'll be trying to feature um, a submission or submissions in both of those shows. Um, really want you to record something. There's um, a link that Matt had sent out. We'll put it in the show notes here as well. Or you can just, if you're comfortable doing it on your own PC or phone, uh, you can do that. Um, just to record your thoughts and send them through to us. That's our email address, podcast at nonearnever.net, and we are keen to hear from you and your specific memories of um, of those games. Definitely. Do get involved. It was going to be a lot of fun. Heroes and villains. Next section then, Dave. Heroes and villains for our fixture. Who have you picked as our hero, please? Uh, well, for his heroic performance in goal for our Carling Cup tie at Stamford Bridge in November 2008, uh, not only during the game, but most especially in the penalty shootout, Brian Jensen is our Chelsea away day hero. Uh, following a creditable 1-1 draw after Adam Akinbae's goal had cancelled out Didier Drogba's opener, the fourth round tie went to the dreaded penalty shootout. Uh, despite Wade Elliott's penalty being saved, Brian Jensen kept out spot kicks from Wayne Bridge and John Obi Mikel to send Burnley through to the next round. It was a very memorable night for over 6,000 travelling Burnley fans at Stamford Bridge and a great all-round team performance. But for his heroics between the sticks, we just had to choose Brian Jensen as our hero this week. Absolutely. Fully approved, Dave. Fully approved. Um, what about our villain then? Who's gonna, Who's our pantomime boo? Uh, yes, definitely a pantomime villain this week. Uh, <laughs> our villain is the manager who was in charge of Chelsea for the 1-1 draw between the two teams in the match at Stamford Bridge in 2015. Uh, yes, you've guessed it. Uh, Jose Mourinho is our villain this week. Uh, he didn't take kindly to an incident between Ashley Barnes and Nemanja Matic, who himself went on to get sent off for a retaliatory push. Uh, not only did jo- uh, Jose go off on a very cryptic tirade in his post-match interview, quoting the minutes of the incidents which he believed changed the game, uh, and it, but he refused to discuss them in any, any more detail. He continued his verbal assaults by booking himself onto the Sky Sports flagship Sunday morning show to air his grievances. Uh, Burnley had no equivalent right of reply, but the club was slightly more measured in their response, with Sean Dykes recording a very calm rebuttal, which went on Claret's player, YouTube and social media channels, but did not get quite the same level of exposure. No, it was an absolute... Egypt that game it was, it was it was a really pathetic performance even by Mourinho's standards it was like everybody knew he was just completely spitting his dummy out but it, yeah it was a pretty poor performance and um, so yeah I'm glad he gets the villain um finally then going back to the game at the weekend who is going to be our referee please David uh, our referee for this Sunday's match is Graham Scott. Uh, he's from Abingdon in Oxfordshire. Uh, and this will be the second time he's taken charge of a Burnley match this season, as he was also in the middle for our 1-0 win at Arsenal back in December. Uh, as well as Burnley winning each of the last three matches he's taken charge of, uh, which also includes the home wins against Southampton and Everton last season, uh, he's also shown red cards to opposition players in the last two. Uh, they were Everton's Seamus Coleman and Arsenal's Granite Jacker. Uh, the only other red card in his previous 17 games involving Burnley was shown to Gael Bigirimana in a championship game at Coventry City in 2011. Uh, and finally for this section, Michael Oliver will be the video assistant referee on Sunday afternoon. Excellent. Statman Dave's Stat of the Week. Well, I know you're not going to leave it there, Dave, because you never do, because you like to treat our listeners. So why don't you put your hand into the massive great big bank of stats and give our listeners the Dave Roberts Miscellaneous Stat of the Week. Uh, well, this week for a change, I'm going to share another topical stat, uh, which Burnley FC club commentator and friend of the show, Phil Bird, had shared earlier this week. Uh, that's mainly because I was struggling to think of any good stats related to Burnley's matches against Chelsea. Anyway, here it is. Uh, Burnley's win over Aston Villa during the week was Sean Dyche's 127th league win as Burnley manager. This means that he's now presided over more wins with Burnley in the Premier League, 64, than he did during his time with us in the Championship, 63. Wow, that is a good stat. I like this. I like you having the confidence to say, I couldn't think of one. I'm going to pick somebody else's. Well done. Um, well, before Dave and I start to have a think about uh, what we expect to see at the weekend, we did get an opposition view for you this week, and we spoke to David Chigge. Is that how we pronounce it? Chidge. Chidge. 
Kid Yes from Chelsea Fancast, who provide us with this episode's Opposition View. Opposition View. Hello, no name never people. Hope you're all well. Uh, it's Stanford Chidge from the Chelsea Fancast here. Just to give you a few thoughts about Chelsea and uh, starting off with Frank Lampard being sacked, which, as you can imagine, uh, for most of the match uh, going supporters, in fact, all of the match going supporters, I would say, absolutely gutted that he got the tin tack on Monday. Um, I suppose looking back on it, it was all too predictable, wasn't it? But I think so many of us hoped that uh, the arrival of Frank Lampard at the club would mean a real change in direction and a change in policy and we wouldn't see this kind of short-term firing of managers whenever you know you suffered one defeat, which seems ridiculous, doesn't it? But sadly, I'm afraid uh, you know they've been true to form and you know run a bad form has seen him go. I mean, I, I would have to say that most of us would have been prepared to put up with that. I think we'd all bought into this idea of a more long-term plan, bringing the youngsters through. And of course, you know, you have a legend of the club managing it, then you just identify with it so much more. There's much more of a an emotional connection than having a mercenary who's just out to, you know, improve his own CV. But there you go. Of course, there's not a lot we can do. Uh, we're a club that's owned by a very rich man who uses it as his personal train set. And there's nought we can do. Uh, Thomas Tuchel, um, I mean, the thing is, you know, it's hard to really have any emotional attachment to a guy you know who's not going to be there very long, which I'm afraid is pretty much what we expect. But uh, I thought it was a pretty cautious start against Wolves on Wednesday, although understandable. I mean, he'd only been there really for the afternoon. I think he'd only done one training session with the players. Uh, it was interesting to see him, you know, kind of play this 3-4-2-1 using uh, hudson Adoy as a wing-back, um, pushing Havertz, you know, into more of a number 10 role and playing three at the back, of course. And, I mean, they look solid, but, I mean, Wolves had absolutely no ambition at all. Uh, I mean, they played with 10 men behind the ball most of the time. In fact, even with that, they looked like, you know, they, they had two chances where they should have scored, which would have been a bit of a, a downer of a start for him. Um, but, you know, and he also picked players that most of us don't really rate or like much. Rudiger, I don't really rate. Jorginho and Kovacic, Kovacic in the midfield has been proven time and time and time again not to be... Uh, you know, very successful. And of course, he benched our best player, which is uh, Mason Mount, you know, until the last 10 minutes. So, you know, a bit inauspicious, really. But as I said, I think, you know, at the end of the day, he's the manager and you're going to back him and we all will. I thought his press conference uh, on Thursday was was really impressive, actually. He comes across as a very smart, very likeable guy. He said all the right things. He was very magnanimous. He was, uh, he paid due respect to Frank. So, you know, he's smart enough to get the supporters on side, and I think he will. And, you know, his track record's interesting. And, uh, I mean, if you can get a tune out of Havertz and Werner, which I'm sure that's what the club want, then I suspect he'll do pretty well. He's got some good players there. You know, Chelsea have got a strong squad, and I'm sure, you know, that he will get a tune out of them uh, sooner probably rather than later. Um, as I said earlier on, you know, I, I was, I, you know, we don't like losing matches, obviously. it's It's annoying when you're not competing for titles or trophies or even getting near the top four but you know I think we're only four points off it this season's been absolutely bonkers it's hard to predict anything that's going on at all so you know I wasn't that concerned really it was annoying but I was prepared to stick with it and Frank um, as for getting a, a, a new manager bounce I, I would be more worried if I was Burnley than uh, than I was if I was Wolves because he would have had a bit more time uh, he would have had a, a look at, you know, the players that he put out. Hopefully he'll realise that, you know, Jorginho and Kovacic in midfield is just beyond stupid. And he'll put Kante and Mount in there. And that'll be a very different proposition than we were against Wolves. So, yeah, I'm I'm expecting and really hoping for a much improved performance against Burnley on Sunday. As for you lot, I think, I mean, as you know, I've got a bit of a soft spot for Burnley. I'm a particular fan of Sean Dyche. I think he's a very good manager. And I think he does, he, he absolutely gets the best out of that Burnley side. And he's smart. And uh, I know you were struggling earlier on in the season. Um, but I kind of had a feeling he would turn it around and it looks like it. I mean, that performance against Liverpool was just brilliant. I mean, obviously, you know, every every football fan in their right mind can't stand Liverpool. So 
any team giving them a bloody nose is always great value. But it was particularly delightful seeing Burnley do it. And of course, even better, you know, Sean Dyche putting that idiot clock back in his place. That was a, a thing of rare beauty. So well done, Burnley. Well done, Sean Dyche. Um... Well, the expected lineup, I mean, you know, who knows? It's so early in Thomas Tuchel's days, but I think he'll probably stay with three at the back. But, I mean, it's really hard to know because, I mean, apparently what he does is he, he will pretty much, you know, select a team based on who he's playing. So how he'll line up against Burnley, I have no idea really. But I wouldn't be surprised to see him play three at the back, in which case, you know, again, I think you'll see... Well, I, w- I would hope to see James come in instead of Aspie. So James... Silver and I'm uh, Rudiger. I don't really rate Rudiger, but he's better in a back three. I think he's better suited to it than Zuma is certainly. So I wouldn't be surprised to see that. Although I, I would imagine Aspie being the captain, he'll probably stay with him. So I suspect you'll get Mendy, Aspie, Silver, Rudiger. If he goes three, four, two, one again, then maybe you know. I mean, it'll. Would, will he find find room for Rhys James? Possibly not. In which case, you've got Chilwell. Maybe even Alonso might get a recall because we know he's very good as a wing back. I thought Hudson Odoi was fantastic against Wolves, so I, I would imagine he'll start. He's got to have Kante and Mount in the in the two in the midfield, and then higher up, I would instead of Ziyech, who I I'm not impressed with at the moment at all. I think he's a lazy player, a lot of talent, but he doesn't really put much of a shift in. Havertz I thought was pretty good against Wolves, and he looks happier with Tuchel there. So I would have Havertz and Pulisic playing just behind, I would play Tammy. Uh, Tammy or Werner, not Giroud. I think Giroud, it's just not going to suit his his way of playing, to be honest. I mean, I know he holds the ball up, but he just doesn't have the leg. So I would have Tammy or Werner up front, and as I said, with Havertz and Pulisic behind him. Um, and I'm going to go for a win. I think he'll get, get a win under his belt. And, uh, you know, we always do quite well. I mean, ironically, the last time... Uh, we played you at home was that I, I took my nephew to his first Chelsea match and I think we won three nil so I wouldn't be surprised if we have a similar score actually but I know you lot have been playing well and you are tough to beat but uh, I think we'll have too much for you on Sunday so I'm going to go two 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 one three one something like that stick my colours to the mask I'll say three one uh, so there you go and uh, I, I would be amazed if uh, Burnley fans want to listen to the waffle that we do but if you do it's called the Chelsea Fancast, and uh, we're live every Monday night uh, at 7 o'clock, and it comes out as a podcast on all the usual places like Acast, Spotify, iTunes, all of that kind of stuff. And we also do a preview show on a Friday night, and actually, if you are around on Friday night, we'll have one of your own on there. Uh, the lovely Dave Roberts is joining us uh, live at 7.20pm Friday night and again that will be up as a podcast so he'll be telling us all about what he thinks about Burnley and what they're going to do to us on Sunday anyway um, obviously I don't wish you any good luck at all on Sunday against us but I really do hope you stay up Um, as I said I've got a soft spot for Sean Dyche and Burnley it's a brilliant ground great place to go when we go and play you away and I really miss not doing that this season even though I usually freeze my box off when I do but uh, I hope you stay up and, and good luck to you for the season Okay, you also appeared on some Chelsea fan casts as well this week, didn't you, Dave? You gave a little bit of an intro. You've got quite a, a nice little rebuttal to share with us that I think our listeners will enjoy. Yeah, it's quite amusing. It was, it was um, a, a live show they did, and not used to doing live shows. You might not believe that this this isn't live. This is uh, edited, and, uh, and hey. <laughs> you might not believe that either. <laughs> am, am I spoiling the illusion? <laughs> Yeah, I was like, I don't think we get it out of this one in a hurry, Dave. Move on, move on, move no. on. Um, anyway, they, they, they were asking me about the game and I was giving my views and uh, one of the, not not Dave, but one of the other guys uh, chipped in and said, um, uh, why, why do Burnley always have such a slow start to the season? And it was like just serving one up for me to, to fire back oh. at them. Because I, oh. I just... Ca- I just came back with, well, yeah, didn't really, wasn't really the case in the uh, 2017 18 season when we beat Chelsea at Stamford Bridge, was it? Excellent. Well done. Nicely off I was the proud, I was proud of myself for that. You should be. And the sharpness and the quickness. You took one for us there, Dave. I really like it. It's like they've probably just uh, selectively taken out the memory. It's a lot of it's just laziness where they don't bother to learn about us. So, yeah, well done. Um, but other than that, how are you feeling about the game generally? I mean, Chelsea are not in great shape at the moment. We are riding high. It generally feels like this would be a really good opportunity for Burnley to get something from this game. 
Uh, there is that, and there is also the possibility of the new manager bounce as well. We've got um, Thomas Tuchel's come in as at Chelsea, so that might be a, 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 a more difficult one. You know, players trying to make an impression and ones who've perhaps been underperforming before um, having a point to prove. So that that might be uh, an extra factor on, on Sunday. Um, we've got one or two injuries, as we know. I think uh, Charlie Taylor's unlikely to be back in. And I don't think uh, Ashley Barnes will be uh, risked. And we've got a doubt, we think, possibly over um, Josh Brownhill as well. Although uh, Jack Court did so well when he came back yeah, in, I think he he'll just slot there. back into the side. That might well be the only change, I suspect. Maybe uh, uh, Jack Cork um, coming into the side on, on Sunday. Yeah, I, I don't buy the new new manager bounce. It's a myth. It's been it's been disproven that it's actually... It, it's more, you, you tend to just hear see the positive headlines when a new club... Sorry, when a club under a new manager wins that first game, but more often than not, they don't. Um, it is actually a myth. I think sports psych- psychologists have, have written about that, so I'm not having that. I think, I think Chelsea at the moment are in really bad shape, um, and I think with the confidence that we're playing and, and how well we're doing, I think this would be a really good opportunity for us to get some some points. So I'm going to be bold this week, Dave, and I'm going to say, I think Burnley will win two nil. How's that? Two nil away. Um... Mm, you're, not, uh, you're not going to share my enthusiasm, are you? I'm not. Well, I'm, I'm. I'm going to be consistent. I'm going to go with the prediction I gave on the Chelsea fan cast as well when I um, sat on the fence again and went for a one-one draw. Oh, Dave, <laughs> we're going to have to get you more positive. You and your one-one draws. One-one is positive. One minute with Chelsea, we don't. We don't often get results there. Well, this is this is the thing. This is the season. This is the season, Dave. That we can do it. Be positive. Um, we'll do. I hope less- you're right. <laughs> I hope, I hope <laughs> I'm wrong and you're right. Excellent. Well, gosh, can we, Matt, can you take a clip of that if you listen to this recording? Because I don't think I'm afraid to say that. Uh, but listeners, do let us know what you think the result will be um, at the weekend if you listen to this before the game starts. You can tweet us at none and ever, or you can email us at podcast at none and ever.net. And we want some score predictions, please. And always some team selections as well. We like team selections. I like to hear what our listeners think. Um, you know, be the manager for the day. Who would you put um, in the first team? Who would you put on the bench? How would your formation be? Let me know. I'm interested. Fantasy Premier League update. Okay, Dave, second half of the show, and it's, of course, the much-loved and much-coveted Fantasy Premier League in team known and ever. Um, So we are, of course, finishing up on game week 20, I believe, uh, which consisted of a full midweek set of matches, which took place on Wednesday, Tuesday and Thursday of this week. So why don't you let our listeners know what the fantasy update is, please? Uh, yeah, well, following the completion of those games, we do have an update for the top place managers who are leading the way in the No Near Never League table. Uh, we've got a top, we're going to do a top five, but fifth and sixth have got the same number of points. We're going to read out the top six. Uh, Joseph Golby's down to sixth position with 1,236 points. Uh, Steve Holden is also on 1,236, but must, yes, go, must be higher based on last week's points. He got more in uh, that game week. Uh, We've got Adam Dennett in fourth place on 1,243. Gary Proctor is in third on 1,244. So it's very tight in there again. Uh, And Chris Stanworth has gone up to second place with 1,249 points. But once again, uh, non-mover at number one is Charlie Bins. uh, 1,267, a lead of 18 points at the top. Wow, oh, that's good. Uh, what about none and ever update then? How's the team doing? Uh, oh, do you really want to know? Do I have a choice? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, you've gone it's down. Not good news coming my way. <laughs> it's not good news. No, uh, you're down two places to two hundred thirty eighth. Uh, you've now got seven hundred eighty three points. That was uh, just twenty nine for the week. Um, and I've gone up. I'm up 11 places, 218th position uh, on 1,062 points. Uh, that was 53 for the week. And I did close the gap slightly on Richard Steele, who's still uh, the best place manager among the rest of the No Near Never team. He's in 85th place on exactly 1,100 points. Excellent. Um, and what about the Kings of Game Week 20 then? Do we have some stats for those? Uh, we have those 11 players. Yeah, the 11 players in the team in a 4 5 1 formation. Uh, and if you had all of these players, you would have scored 140 points. Um, the high scoring manager across all of the 7 million plus teams, that's not our league, that's across everyone um, who've entered the competition this season, uh, was 123 for the week. So that was a, a really good performance. Uh, but the average uh, for Game Week 20 across every 
everyone was 42 points. Uh, but these were the players you needed to have if you wanted to get the highest points to- uh, total for last week. Uh, we had uh, Ariola of Fulham in goal. We had uh, four defenders, which were Cancelo of Manchester City, uh, Alexander-Arnold of Liverpool, uh, Dawson of West Ham and Thiago Silva of Chelsea, our next opponents. Uh, then our five midfielders were Suchek, Mane, uh, Gundogan, uh, Saka and Rafina of Leeds. Uh, and then the lone striker was uh, Lacazette of Arsenal. They were the 11 players. Um, and the highest scoring player overall for Game Week 20 was Manchester City the defender. Uh, that's Joe Cancelo, who picked up 17 points. Excellent. Uh, I'm just I'm having some technical issues this week with this with our script, young Dave. So just going to just bear with me a moment because I'm completely and utterly lost my pace of where we are. Uh, so we've got kings of game week six. So now we are we now on opposition opposition, opposition three to watch. Yes. yes, please do go ahead. Uh, well, Chelsea's highest scoring players in the fantasy Premier League so far this season, up to and including game week twenty, are uh, Ben Chilwell is out in front with eighty five points. Uh, Mason Mount has got 72, and Timo Werner uh, has 70 points. Uh, so with all three, I think, of those like to be in Chelsea's team on Sunday, they're certainly three to watch. Definitely. That is a really good one. Uh, well, obviously, we're going to bring you another Fantasy Premier League update in our next preview show with whatever information is available. You're going to have to bear with Dave at the moment because so many times we're recording preview shows in the middle of game week, last one and game week, this one. So we will try and give you as much information as we possibly can, um, which will be recorded ahead of the very tough midweek game at home to Manchester City, which I don't think any of us are much looking forward to. Uh, But yes, we will give you an update as soon as we can. Statman Dave's quiz question. And finally, young Dave, let's close out this week's show with, of course, the very exciting Quiz question. What have you decided to set our listeners this week? Okay, this week's quiz question is, uh, prior to this weekend, Burnley have played 50 League and Cup games away at Chelsea since 1905. But we want to know the name of the player who, with six goals, is the top scorer in this fixture for those past matches played at Stamford Bridge. Hmm, that's a tough question. How do our players submit their answers, please? How do they get in touch? Uh, You can get in touch with your guests using any of these methods. You can either tweet us or send us a direct message preferably, as we've mentioned earlier, on Twitter. That's at no near never. And if you DM us, then no one sees your answer. That's uh, a good thing. Um, You can email us, podcast at no near never dot net. Or you can also reply to the post this preview show on either the No No, Nay Never Facebook page or on YouTube. And we'll reveal the correct answer at the start of our next preview show. Excellent. Well done, Dave. And finally, I think we've got some um, any other business haven't we to deal with before we, we finish off the show? Uh, Yeah, a couple of things. Uh, In our last preview show, we gave a mention to the growing number of Burnley fans in North America who've joined the North America Clarets Group. Uh, You may not be aware, but around half of the downloads and listens to this podcast are from outside the UK, Um, as well as numerous UK-based supporters groups. We know there's a growing number of organised supporters groups around the world. So wherever you're listening to us, why not get in touch via the usual channels, and we'll try to plug some of the other worldwide Clarets groups in a future show. Excellent. I could not agree more. Well, that's all we've got time for this preview show. My thanks go to David Chidgay from Chelsea Fancast for his opposition view, to Turf Moor Stadium announcer Dominic Walker for his specially recorded preview show announcements, to producer Matt, who just does a phenomenal job of editing the not live Thanks, Dave. Podcast and get it all together. Uh, but finally, to Statman Dave for all of his hard work in putting together this show. It's just a phenomenal amount of work and he, he does such a good job. And we basically wouldn't have a preview show without him. So thank you very much, Dave. Uh, my final thanks go to you, the listener, for downloading and listening this episode. Your support is very much appreciated and we would not be here without you. Um, we will be back with the analysis show probably in the early part of next week where we'll be looking at um, looking back at that Villa game and also what happens this weekend's fixture. And Dave and I will get a preview show out, we think, what we do early next week, which we'll try and record yeah. over the end for that City match. So keep an eye on social media while fixtures are a bit all over the place and we will give you um, as much heads up as we can of new shows that are there. In the meantime, please take care of yourselves, take care of each other. Um, if anybody is struggling in these difficult times, we're in the middle of another lockdown and, and you know, it's dark, it's cold and 
it feels like this pandemic is never ending. If you do feel like you're struggling a little bit and you would like somebody to talk to, Team Non Nevers lines are always open. You can tweet us, you can contact us on our Facebook page, or you can drop us an email. We have a lot of people who email us and we do like, we have pen pals, we do like to write back. So if you just feel like you need a little bit of company, take your mind off things, you're more than welcome to get in touch. This has been the preview show brought to you by the Known and Never podcast. Until next time. I hope I'm wrong and you're right.